for today's lecture, it was my plan, um, as I've told you, I think, before, to start CFD. Uh, we, I told you a little bit of a motivation last class about why uh, CFD is useful. But I will delay that lecture um, because I want to make sure that you have some of the material for pipe flow before you have to do your labs. We have to coordinate the fact that uh, everybody has to do their labs and uh, the TAs want you to do it before you go on the uh, Thanksgiving holiday because after you come back, there's only two weeks left and then there are exams and everything and so they don't want you to be doing a lab report at the same time as studying to the, for the exam. So to, to try to even things out the best we can, um, the lab number three is going to be just the week before Thanksgiving. And uh, so we're going to do pipe flow first this couple of weeks, and I'll uh, come back to the CFD lecture, um, hopefully just before the holiday. Okay? So that's what we're going to do today. Pipe flow. And uh, to give you an idea of sort of the importance of, of this subject, here's a, a feature of one of the biggest pipe projects, um, that, that one of the biggest engineering applications of pipe flow. This is the Alaskan pipeline that covers about 800 miles. And so it's a great engineering feat. And uh, designing such, such a system, of course, it's a, it's a difficult and uh, not only designing, building, but also maintaining this, this um, pipeline is a, a huge engineering project. Uh, other applications, of course, of pipe flow are the city distribution of water and uh, sewer piping and domestic water. In everybody's house, we have then a piping system. And so the, it, it's such a uh, ubiquitous application of mechanical engineering that uh, it can't be stressed enough how this is an important engineering application. And even in new things like um, studying the the circulatory system of, of humans, uh, this is of the same, the same sort of, um, the, same, the same theories and techniques apply. In fact, as I was telling you some, uh, a few lectures ago, the origin of the basic um, uh, theory of pipe flow in the laminar case, which is Poisset flow, is a, um, the interest of uh, Poiseuille to study blood flow, the study of uh, flow in capillaries. And so that's, that's really the beginning of this whole, um, this whole subject. So let's pick up from that exact situation, which is laminar pipe flow. We've already discussed it, and we developed the solution for pipe flow from simplifying the Navier-Stokes equations, if you recall. And we obtained the parabolic velocity profile characteristic of Poiseuille flow. We could solve the simplified form of the Navier-Stokes completely for that case, and we obtained the parabolic uh, velocity profile. Uh, here, and this in this expression, V max is the maximum velocity that occurs at the center line, and it can be expressed in terms of the radius of the pipe, the pressure drop on a given distance divided by 4 mu, the viscosity, and L, the distance across um, which we see that pressure drop. And this is also equal to 2 times the average velocity. And we use that to um, express the volumetric flow rate, for example, in terms of the average velocity. So we, we, we're familiar with this. We developed it. Yes? So Vmax is just the maximum velocity. Yes, the maximum velocity, which occurs at the center line, right? That's V max here. And the average velocity uh, we obtain from the volumetric flow rate. The volumetric flow rate is obtained by integrating this. And we get the volumetric flow rate divided by the area, and that's the average velocity. And, and we developed this last time. So... Um, the wall shear stress, since we can obtain everything from Navier-Stokes in this case, the wall shear stress uh, can be obtained from the Newtonian fluid expression mu 
uh, we call it Vs, Vs, Vz here, Vz, uh, dr, and at a radius of capital R, where that's the radius of the pipe, of course, that's the location of the wall, and this is for a Newtonian fluid. So to obtain this, we do dvdr. Right? We have the expression for the velocity here, so we take the derivative of the velocity and plug it in here to get the wall shear stress. So dv z dr is equal to v max, I've just multiplied over by v max obviously, and times minus 2 r divided by r squared, capital R squared. You see just the derivative of that expression up here. And uh, that is also going to be equal to, it turns out, uh, minus for the average velocity r, because uh, v max, right? We, v max, for v max, we put the average velocity here, divided by the radius of the pipe squared. So we see that the Free, the, sorry, the uh, wall shear stress tau w is equal to, um, we have, we're going to put uh, for the radius here, well, of course, we evaluate this R, capital R, but we're going to express it in terms of the diameter, because that's the consensus usually to express this in terms of the diameter, and we have also mu, so because of the fact that, um, diameter of the pipe is equal to 2 times the radius, we get minus 8 mu v average divided by d. One of the, one of the r's cancels out. The sign of the wall shear stress is negative because the shear stress points in the opposite direction of um, flow. So we, since we already know which direction it points, we don't need to worry about the sign any longer. We, we, we know what that means. So um, from the wall shear stress, we could, of course, calculate the total friction drag inside the pipe. But we also can do the following. We can uh, do a free body diagram of a small element of fluid inside the pipe. And if everybody's got that down, yes, okay. Let's look at a free body diagram. So imagine we have, again, the pipe. The pipe is here. And inside the pipe, where, of course, we have our parabolic velocity profile, any um, piece is so, so imagine as this a little bit, a small element of fluid, which is going to be of cylindrical shape, when subject to this parabolic velocity profile, after a small amount of time, it's going to move down in the axial direction and also be deformed by the parabolic velocity profile, right? This is what's going to happen. But let's look at that little small element of fluid and do a free body diagram of it. So we're going to consider a small I'm going to draw it big, but it's actually a small element of fluid which has cylindrical shape and it's going to have dimensions small r for radius and a certain length, let's just call it little l. And we're going to do a free body diagram. So this is steady flow, so there's no acceleration. But um, layers of fluid next to each other will have slightly different velocity, right, because of the velocity distribution here. And therefore, there is some shear stress. So let's do the free body diagram of that small cylinder. And we have pressure on both sides. Um, uh, and we're just going to do the, free, the forces on the x direction. So we have the pressures on each side, let's call this one P1, uh, the force is pressure times area, 
the area is pi r squared. On the other side, we're going to have uh, P1 minus delta P. We know that the pressure is always going to be smaller in the uh, downstream, right? So P this pressure is smaller than P1 times the same area, pi r squared. And there's also a shear stress, Let's, uh, a force due to shear stress. Let's put the total force due to shear stress here as tau times the area. Which area? The tangential area of the cylinder, of course, right? So it's 2 pi r times L. This is the shear stress acting on a lateral surface, right? The lateral surface of the cylinder, which has the area 2 pi r times L. Okay, so now we do a force balance. And... Uh, in the x-direction, and you see that we get um, pi 1, sorry, p1 pi r squared minus p1 minus delta p pi r squared and minus tau 2 pi r l equal to 0. And, of course, this term cancels with the one that has the P1, right? Then we're going to be left with only this, this term here and that one. One of the R cancels out and the pi cancels out. And so we have the minus also cancels out. So we have a plus here, delta P. Only one R is left. But I'm going to bring it to the other side. Equals to 2 tau. So I've got the R here, and I'm going to move the L to the other side to express it this way. That's our force balance, the result of the basic balance of forces which is needed to drive the flow along the pipe. Right? Okay, um, now note that in this expression, <coughs> the left-hand side of this expression is uh, not a function of r. The left is not a function of r. So therefore, the right-hand side must also not be a function of r. We have two things that are equal to each other. In the left, there's no r. Therefore, on the right, it must not be a function. It must be constant with respect to r. Yes? Sorry, shouldn't there be a negative sign on here? I've moved this negative side canceled with this one. Oh, okay. And I've moved the one to the other side. So, note this. Left-hand side is not a function of r. Therefore, the right-hand side must not be a function of r. And the only way for that to happen is that tau must be proportional to r so that the r's would cancel out. There's no functionality with respect to r, so tau must be equal to some constant times r. Also, we know that at um, r equals 0, the shear stress must be maximum because that's the wall. So that's where the shear stress is max. And at r equal to, um, sorry, that's wrong what I'm saying. That's the pipe wall. I want the pipe wall, right? Where's the pipe wall? r equal capital R. That's the pipe wall. And at r equals 0, that's the center line. At the center line, then the shear stress must be 0. There is no shear stress there because at exactly at that point, the gradient is uh, 
zero, the gradient of velocity. So at the center line, <coughs> tau must be <coughs> zero. So <coughs> the functional expression of tau looks like this. Uh, let's see, do I, yeah, I'm just going to draw it up there. Just going to use this little spot here and draw the functional expression. So if I'm just looking at the pipe, and this is the center line, the value of tau, suppose that this is zero, I'm going to do a plot that's kind of sideways uh, to your usual, the way you usually draw a function, but it's because I want to draw it inside the pipe. It goes from a value zero to a value maximum at the wall, and it's linear. And so this is tau at zero, which is equal to zero. This is tau max, which is tau at the wall. And basically this line that I've drawn here is tau as a function of r. And it's just linear, going from a maximum value at the walls to zero at the central line. At the wall, so you see at the wall, um, we need to have c times d half because that's the radius at, at the wall. Oh dear. Can you close that window? It's quite, quite windy today. So we can express c as, thank you Nathan, thanks, as a function of the wall shear stress to tau wall divided by d. And then we put that back in the um, equation here. And so tau is equal to 2 tau at the wall, r divided by d. This is our expression for the shear stress inside the pipe. It's a function of r only, and it's linear. You had a question? Yes. Um, Please. The assumption that tau of zero is zero, is, is that, where, where do we get It's that? not an assumption. Uh, recall that uh, tau is equal to mu times dv, the velocity, dr. And right at the center line, the parabola right at the center line, that slope is zero. <coughs> right? So the tau has to be zero there. Make sense? Just kind of look, look at it sideways. Basically, inside the pipe, we're drawing everything sideways, right? But imagine that that's basically a function with respect to r, and that function reaches a maximum there, so the derivative is 0 there. And so tau is 0 there. So the if we had an element of fluid that was down here, yeah. it would, after a little while, it would be sort of sheared like that, you see, because the uh, velocity is, is larger towards the center line. Whereas if there's a tiny little element in the middle, it's kind of going to be symmetric, the effect that it has, like I've drawn it in the red. Make sense? All right, so that's our shear stress. It is a linear expression. We express it with respect to the shear at the wall. We've just written this down. I'm writing it again and, uh, because we're going to use it. And we also had this other expression that we're going to need again 
which was delta P over L equals to 2 times the shear stress divided by R. This was uh, our force balance. We just done that from the free body diagram. So let's express the pressure drop in terms of the wall shear stress. Because basically this pressure drop is due to the friction of the fluid inside the pipe, right? So we need to apply a pressure on to drive the flow in a pipe because as the fluid goes along the pipe, it needs to be able to um, overcome the friction. Delta P is equal to, I'm just going to substitute this one in there and multiply by L. So we have 4 L wall shear stress divided by D. Now, what's interesting about this is that even if the fluid has small viscosity and the pipe is very, very smooth such that the, there is a small wall shear stress, the pressure drop can still be very large if the pipe is long, which is the case for the Alaskan pipeline, right? So this is, this is what this tells us. A small shear stress can result in a large pressure drop if the pipe is long, very long, let's say, L much larger than D, Alaskan pipeline think. There must be a lot of energy being uh, used there to move all that fluid for the 800 miles. Okay. For the Newtonian fluid, Um, we just had that a little bit a while ago, right? We calculated T at the wall in the beginning of the lecture for the Newtonian fluid in terms of the average velocity and viscosity. So you have it in your notes. I'll just pull it up here. <coughs> I'm going to just replace shear at the wall for the Newtonian fluid in, in this expression. So we have delta P is equal to 8... Um, was it, uh, ah, this is the shear, this is the uh, wall shear stress, the wall shear stress, 8 mu V average divided by D, and then we have, that's the wall shear stress, and then we still have 4 L divided by D again, so, so it's clear where these things come from, I'm, ri I'm writing it that, that way, so now I'm multiply and make it look pretty, and I'm going to write 32 mu V average L divided by D squared. D squared? Yes, correct. So for the volumetric flow rate, which is V average times the area, I'm going to express V average in terms of delta P and you know move everything to the other side simply to 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 express the wall the uh, volumetric flow rate in terms of delta P and so on. So it's delta P uh, d squared. I'm solving for v v average delta P d squared divided by 32 mu l. And we have the area also, which is P pi. It's a Greek letter anyway. All right. And that's the area. So thirty two times four is one twenty eight. So this is just equal to pi d to the power fourth. I have d squared twice there. And one twenty eight mu delta P over L. And this expression is what is often known as Poiseuille's law, Poiseuille's law. Uh, 
expressing the volumetric flow rate for a given uh, combination of parameters in terms of the diameter of the pipe, the viscosity of the fluid, the length of the pipe that we're talking about, and the pressure drop. Now, what's interesting about this is the very, very strong dependence on the diameter of the pipe. And so, for the Alaskan pipeline, then, uh, to be able to carry the most possible amount of oil, uh, is it oil or gas? I'm not sure even <laughs> what I'm talking about. Um, the pipe, you would want to make it larger in diameter because it depends on the fourth power of diameter. So you can change the uh, volumetric flow rate quite a lot by making the pipe larger. But of course, a larger pipe means more material, it's more expensive, it's heavier. It's, um, so there's, that's the engineering decision, right, that one needs to make. The larger the pipe, the more expensive everything is going to be. So, strongly dependent on pipe sites. Okay, let's consider now what happens if you have an inclined pipe. Suppose now the pipe is, everything is the same, but the pipe in addition has suppose it's flowing uphill like that, it has some inclination. So it's still Poisson flow parabolic because all of the uh, results that we've obtained so far still apply. The difference is we have to replace the pressure drop basically to give you the solution immediately replace the pressure drop delta P by the combined effect of pressure and gravity. So if I'm making, again, a free body diagram of an element of fluid inside the pipe, we're going to have pressure, and we're going to have the shear stress. So that's our shear stress. The, the force due to shear stress is tau times 2 pi rl, as before. It's called, um, let's see, if it's flowing, um, well, let's call this P plus delta P, and this is going to be P here. Uh, no, no two here. It's just a pi r squared. And this is no two over there either. Pi r squared. But in addition, we have a component of weight. So let's consider this angle here to be theta. And so this is going to be the same as this angle, theta. And so the component in this direction is the component multiplied, the, uh, multiplied by the sine of the angle. And therefore, this combined effect of pressure and gravity is delta P minus gamma L sine theta. And the net force in the flow direction is delta P minus gamma L sine theta 
divided by L. So the same, ex the exact same, I'm writing the exact same expression that we had before, only replacing the pressure by the combined effect of pressure and gravity. This is the force balance we had before. And so as a shortcut, I'm just putting immediately the result with the combined effect of pressure and gravity. All of the results for a horizontal pipe are valid. The um, volumetric flow rate, the average velocity, all those things, with the only difference that the um, pressure gradient now has to be adjusted by the elevation term. So we have, for example, for the average velocity, this exact same relation that you have in your notes, uh, only I'm going to replace delta P by delta P minus the gravity comp the component of weight. So we have delta P minus gamma L sine theta d squared divided by 32 mu L. The volumetric flow rate, same. Everything is the same, but we replace delta P by the combined effect of pressure and gravity. D to the power fourth divided by 128 mu L. So basically the, the, um, the driving force for the flow is the pressure gradient augmented by the component of weight in the flow direction. The component of weight in the flow direction is min minus gamma L sine theta. If the flow is downhill, then theta is less than zero and gravity helps the flow. No surprises there. If the flow is uphill, then theta is uh, greater than zero, like we've drawn it here, and gravity works against the flow. Intuitively, that makes sense, of course, right? <laughs> And um, notice also that uh, the term gamma L sine theta is gamma L delta Z, like a hydrostatic term. Hydrostatic type term with delta Z, the change in elevation. Obviously, if there's no flow, the velocity is equal to zero, and delta P has to be equal to gamma delta Z. If V was equal to zero, then delta P is equal to gamma delta Z, and that's just hydrostatics. So it's all consistent. You see that? V equal to zero. Imply, you can see that that implies that delta P is equal to gamma delta Z, just hydrostatics. Happy? When you, um, when you did the force balance on the second, on this incline flow, the, the weight is multiplied by a volume. Is that, is that the logic? It's like gamma L sine theta multiplied by pi R. Remember gamma? is equal to rho g. Right. And when you did the force balance, delta P minus gamma L sine theta has to balance up. The force, the total force, yeah, the force mm -hmm. is weight. But I'm doing weight per unit area. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is force per unit area because it has the units of pressure. In the, the previous
Yeah, yeah. I've skipped all that. And I've just put just the answer, yes. All right, so before we go on the break, let's look at the energy equation for this case. This is kind of one of the most important things for us as engineers is the energy. So recall the energy equation. For incompressible steady flow between two locations in a pipe system or in a between two say two stations in a system, it was in terms of head fluid head. It was pi over gamma, uh, sorry, P, P1 over gamma plus with the kinetic energy uh, correction factor V1 squared over 2G plus Z1 equal to P2 over gamma plus alpha 2 V2 average squared divided by 2G plus Z2 plus the head loss if there are no pumps or turbines in the system. This is just a piece of pipe so no pumps, no turbines, and so we just have the head loss. Looks familiar? So uh, in a pipe, so remember that alpha 1 and alpha 2 are what we call the kinetic energy correction factor. Alpha was equal to 1 for a uniform velocity. But in general, alpha is greater than 1. But in this case, it doesn't really matter because for pipe flow, if we consider just a pipe of the same diameter, alpha 1 is equal to alpha 2, the velocities are also equal, and so that term cancels out anyway. We're considering a piece of pipe with no change in diameter. So alpha 1 v1 squared is equal to alpha 2 v2 squared, and we're only then left in the pressure equation with the, sorry, the energy equation with the pressure and elevation terms. I'm going to write them on both on of uh, pressure and elevation on the same side of the equation, like this, and leave it equal to the head loss. And in this way, the the energy equation tells us that the energy <coughs> dissipation of the viscous forces has to be equal to the work done by the pressure and elevation changes. Pressure and gravity forces. That's, that's what this means. The energy dissipation uh, expressed in the uh, head loss of the viscous forces is equal to the work done by the pressure and gravity forces. Okay, well, let's um, take a 10-minute break here.